one that we went over was that sons know their father. And for those who don't know what a core value is, it's kind of like these are our guiding principles. This is why we exist. We want the world and the people around us to understand this staple. The name Legacy Center has to do with inheritance. You can't build a legacy if you don't have an inheritance. You don't have an inheritance if you don't have a father. And, and it, it's helpful to have a father, but you don't know your father. And that's how we treat God. And so what we're trying to do this month is that we get all of us at that place where we really understand who God is, but also how to walk in power, how to walk in generosity, aspects of God the Father. So Stephen hit it. He didn't know this was my topic today, but our second core value is sons walk in intimacy. And you hear a lot of people right now, I'm not religious. It's all about relationships. I'm not you know, into religion. And it's true, but a lot of people don't even know what relationship looks like with the Lord. You know, we say we're not religious, we have a relationship with God, but we're not seeing any depth or any fruitfulness out of that relationship with God. So what I'm going to teach you guys on today is intimacy. How do I walk with God intimately? Not just go to church, not just pay my tithe, not just do my service, but how do I become a friend of God? How do I become someone that God speaks to, that he gives secrets to? Scripture says that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. That means the presence of God was with him. We don't know if literally God would come down because at that point there was no demarcation. Enoch, he said he walked with God and he no longer walked. So we don't know if God literally came and took him up or he was in worship or in a prophetic um, you know, vision and the Lord took him up. But you can walk so closely with God that there's no demarcation or division between you and the Holy Spirit. That is how God has called us to walk. Sometimes we separate these, all the things of the Spirit are over there. I'm just this carnal person. But we have dual citizenship. What dual citizenship means is that even though we have physical bodies, because we have the Spirit of God living in us, Ephesians says that we are seated in heavenly places with the Father. That means that at any point, if somebody is sick, I can just, if you, even though I'm working, I can say, all right, go to those come, and I pray and they get healed. Or if somebody needs encouragement, even if I'm, you know, running errands, I can step into that stream. It's literally just, you step into it and step out of it. You have dual citizenship. Some of you guys may not really understand what that means because we're all born here, raised here, but we were born in Africa. And so when you have dual citizenship, you get to have, um, you get to have access to two different countries. Two different routes. All right, let's keep going. So we were made for intimacy. God created us out of his benevolence. Benevolence means that God had so much goodness in him. He had so much love in him that he had to create something to love. It wasn't that he was needy or that, you know, he needed someone to affirm him. But the essence of who God is is love. The essence of who God is is goodness. And so from the beginning, the reason why we exist is to be loved by God. From the beginning, before anything else, before your ministry assignment, before your business, before whatever you do, your reason of existence is to be loved by God. And Jeremiah said that, it says that he knit you in your mother's womb. You're not an accident. It doesn't matter if you are a byproduct of rape or your parents didn't love each other. You're not an accident. God is very well aware of who you are and he knit you in your mother's room, in your mother's room because he wanted to love you. The issue happens when we step into the natural realm with our families, they may be jacked up, you know, things may go on, and we may not necessarily feel loved or connected, but if you're gonna learn intimacy, you have to come from that perspective that God loves me and I am loved by God and that's why I exist. Apart from that, everything else is extra. I call it ice. All right? Let's read Colossians 1.15. Hopefully soon when the internet is good at this place, we'll get to have some of the scriptures up here. Uh, Colossians 1.15. We're not going to be in this place long. But we're looking for a real home. So if y'all see some churches, buildings, and stuff for sale, you know, let us know. Colossians 1.15. He said, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This is Jesus. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. 
whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. Even the devil himself is a created being. We're so afraid of the enemy, but scripture says in Luke, we're going to look down at him and say, this is the very thing that tormented me. What this verse is saying is that everything was created by God. Not saying that God created a nemesis or he created demons, but they made a choice. They made a choice to not serve God anymore. They chose to separate themselves from God. But even all of them, even the enemy has to ask permission from God to profit your life. If you're in God, if you said yes to Jesus, he cannot just come in and out of your life. That's not what people are like, oh, I'm in constant warfare. It's been a warfare season for seven years. No, something is wrong. We need to look at the open doors that you have in your life. That should not be normal for a believer. We're seated in heavenly places. That's our norm. Yes, from time to time we're going to struggle with things. But we were, uh, even the enemy does not have access to us like that. But I think we give him too much power. But what this verse is saying, we were all created in him and for him and through him. Verse 17. And, and he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that all things he may have preeminence. Preeminence means he is like head over it all. He's head over our lives. He's head over everything. We were created for him and through him. We were created for love. We were created out of his goodness. Those are the basics of intimacy. All right, let's keep going a little bit. John 3, 16, I'm giving you guys a lot of scripture. And starting the fall, we're actually going to do some Bible series. So I will teach you through the book of John. I will teach you through the book of Matthew. Because we want the people who are here to understand scripture. And so all the series are not going to be topical like this. We're going to have some actual weeks for uh, micro studying the books of the Bible, okay? John 3, 16, how many people know this verse? Jojo has been working on memorizing this one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The goodness of God allowed him to be separated from his son so that he could die for you and for the redemption of your sin. That has to be a basis. That has to be a basis that, you know what, if this man, it says that he bankrupted heaven, he left heaven poor because of the fullness and the richness of who Jesus is, and he came down to earth for you, you are worthy of intimacy, you're worthy of being loved, you're worthy of God walking with you, you're worthy of knowing God's voice, you're worthy of belonging in the kingdom of God. You have to believe this stuff. A lot of us deal with unworthiness, I'm not good enough, uh, you know, I, I can't hear God's voice, I always mess up, I don't know God's will, but that's not the truth. God loved you so much that he even gave his son. So then why wouldn't he, he teach you how to hear him? Why wouldn't he want to walk with you? All right, so I'm kind of debunking some of the lies that we have believed. Last one, last uh, uh, verse, and then I'll give you some simple takeaways. Psalms 27, 4. One thing I ask the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. This is a request that David made to the Lord. He made a request to dwell with Him, to walk with Him, to know Him. A lot of us, we just want God to do it. God, I want to experience your glory. I want to experience your power. But we have to do something. We have to make a request. So I'm going to talk about some of the hindrances to intimacy. Mike just had an awesome breakthrough about two weeks ago, but you know, he decided to go beyond himself. And there are times we're seeking God, we're seeking to know him, and we just kind of wanted to fall on that. But the first decision that you have to make is that I am going to pursue intimacy. When, you know, a husband and a wife, they're dating before they get married, women, let the husband pursue you, okay? Let the guy pursue you. Don't just throw yourself down there. Let him, you know, pour you a little bit, let him take you out. But don't let him do it forever. I remember when my husband and I were dating, he was calling me all the way from Africa all the time. And the one day he's like, so why don't you call me again? I'm like, oh, I just, I was you pursue me, you know? But it was time that I needed to start. I needed to start calling back. But it's the same thing with the Lord. We can't say we want to know God's voice. We want to feel his presence. But we don't take that intentional time to pray.
pursue Him. So number one, create space in your schedule to be with the Lord. It doesn't necessarily have to be all about shaitan, because we love to talk, but we don't love to listen. If it's going to be during your prayer time, make sure that you create space where you're just resting and you're waiting. Oh, and like I said, we'll teach you guys how you hear the voice of God if you don't know. But He may show you an image. He may show you, you may hear something in your spirit. The key with God's voice is that always peace. Even if it's this, you know, big thunderous direction and it's telling you to take over the world, you're always going to have peace. I'm a little bit scared, but I have the peace to move forward. That's how we felt when we started the church. I don't know what's going to happen, but we feel the peace. We're going to do it anyway. So, number one, create space in your schedule to seek the Lord. And when you do that, create time in that in those moments just to be. Okay? The next thing you need to learn is your love language with the Lord. You know, some of you guys have read the book, The Five Love Languages. Yes. If you have it, you'll, if you if we do your premarital counseling, you'll read it. But basically the five love, the love languages are quality time. So some people, you don't need to buy them anything. You don't need to say anything. As long as you spend undivided time with them. Quality time people don't want us to watch TV together. They just kind of want you guys to be together. Just talk. Quality time. So some, some of you guys are wired for quality time. Other people love uh, acts of service. So if you help me wash the dishes, or you help me do my tasks, or if we run errands together, we call it love tank. That feels their love tank. Their capacity. Other people love touch. If you just sit close to me, or hold my hand, or hug. You know, people always think physical touch has to do with sex. It doesn't have anything to do with sex. It has to do with proximity and touch. That's how some of our love languages. Another one are words of affirmation. I promise this is going to tie in together. Words of affirmation. These are people that really, we can just speak. You know, you did such a great job. You're so wonderful. You know, men need these why? Words of affirmation. This really helped them to be like, yeah, I can conquer the world. I always tell women, if a man has one woman that they, you know, that believes in them, they can do anything. Is that true, men? Yeah, just one woman to support them. And so words of affirmation. Um, and then the last one is gifts. Gifts don't have to be expensive. They could be a little letter. Uh, they could be a fruit basket. So the way that we are wired to receive love, and you guys can take this assessment online. Five love languages. It's the same way that we are connected to the Lord. Some of you guys, with God, you can just spend quality time and you'll be fine. Some of you guys, you know, you, you feel your love take after serving and after you're know, doing something for the Lord. Some of you guys in worship, you just tell them, I love you, Jesus. You're so awesome. And he gives you a prophetic word. Someone speaks it over your life. Your love take is full. You need to figure out how you connect with the Father. Not everybody connects to the Father the same way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay? So all of us are wired to connect with the Lord differently. That's why you cannot compare yourself. You can't say, oh, she prophesies like this. Or, oh, you know, he, he gets goosebumps wants and shape. Everybody has a different way that God wants to connect with them. I love nature. I love being at the beach. I love being in the mountains. I hear God clearly during those times. I don't have enough time to get away as much as I'd like. But... That's great. Some people love jogging. When they're jogging, God speaks to them during those times. Don't be stuck in this box that I gotta read, I gotta pray, and that's it. Some of you guys love to cook while you're cooking. Speak to the Holy Spirit. Hear what God is saying, okay? So find a way that God connects with you. I know this is throwing some of you guys way off because you've been taught that it has to be done in a different way. But anything that we invite the Holy Spirit in becomes sacred, okay? So don't feel like I have to be in church in order to hear God's voice. All right, so we've talked about creating space. We've talked about making sure that you understand how God connects to you, how God uh, speaks to you. It's really, really important. And then you want to get in a culture that pushes intimacy. Intimacy is one of those things that, you you know, if you're really busy or you're in a place where everything is about productivity or what you do, that we can override. But you want to get in a place where they create space for you to connect with God. It's really important. You don't want to be somewhere where you just do, do, do. But you've got to have time. So, you know, as we are uh, growing, there's so many things that we want to do. We're just meeting with all people. We have so much on our list. But one of the things that we're going to have are what we call soaking sessions. When we start our 24 7 prayer house, we're going to have times where you just come and you rest. You can paint, you can, uh, you know, work on your journal, but it's just a quiet place where you can meet with the presence of God. 
You need to be in a culture that's going to push your relationship with God more than what you do for God. It's so important because especially you gifted people. It's so easy for someone to say, oh, you're gifted. Do this, do this, do that. But they're not caring about your soul. They don't care how well you're doing in your spirit. But you need to be in a culture that says, you know what? You did a great job. But this week I need you to sit down. Not because I'm punishing you. But you need to rest. You're tired. You need to be in a culture that makes your intimacy with the Father preeminent. It makes it uh, the number one uh, the number one thing. Lastly, John 15, 5, and I'm going to pray for several people. But John 15, 5 is one of my favorite verses. The whole chapter of John 15 really talks about intimacy or abiding. That's the other word you're going to hear when we talk about intimacy with God. is abiding with God. Abiding means being in the Father, being inside Him, not just next to Him, okay? So John 5, Jesus is saying that, you know, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And apart from Him, I can do nothing. If anything you do in your life is apart from the Lord, it's not going to succeed. You may have success for a season, but only what you do in the Father and for the Father is going to succeed. That doesn't mean all of you guys have to pray. But if God has called you to be a math teacher and you say, you know what, God, yes, I have my principle, but you're my boss and I am doing this in you and you're in me, you know, open my eyes when I'm in the classroom for things to pray about or people to minister to. You are in the Father and the Father is in you. Anything apart from that, we're not going to bear fruit. And so I took a whole year to study intimacy because I didn't know how this thing worked. I'm like, the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. Okay, what does that look like? And what the, the Lord showed me was just, I wish I had brought it up here. I love using tools sometimes. But if you take one of those big, big, cozy blankets that you may have at home and literally wrap yourself in it from the top to the bottom, that's you being in the Father. But it's not only like the blanket is around you, it's also like the, black, the blanket is through you. And so there, be, there is a place in God where there's no demarcation. That doesn't mean we're not going to struggle sometimes or we're not going to sin. But what it means is that every time you make a decision, you say, okay, Holy Spirit, is that you? Every, and, and then after a while, you will automatically know, oh, that's Holy Spirit. That's not Holy Spirit. But we have to be intentional in learning how to be in the Father and the Father being in us. Okay? One simple way to do that is instead of just thinking, take your thoughts and turn them to questions to the Lord. So instead of just saying, ooh, that's a good idea, say, okay, God, is that a good idea? Instead of just, and it, it doesn't have to be this religious, but I would do it because I'm a little intense. But I'll say, God, what do you want us to cook tonight? Instead of just, oh, I'm going to make this. I wanted to invite him into every part of my day. I wanted to invite him into every decision. And after a while, it was really easy to know when God was there and when God was not there. But if you want to start with a simple, basic thing, you want to kind of measure how intimate am I or how well am I abiding, think about your thoughts. How often are you thinking and trying to figure things out on your own? How often are you, you know, someone, how is logical? Who loves to think and think and think and think until they can't think anymore? That can be a lot, very draining. It can take up a lot of your time. How about inviting the Holy Spirit in this? God, what do you think about this? God, how should I do this? Instead of just going on and on and on in your thought. Learning to be intimate, learning to abide is, uh, my definition of abiding is intentional acknowledgement of the presence of God. That means I go throughout my day intentionally acknowledging Him. It doesn't have, like I said, it doesn't have to be this, oh, now I shut that time, you're walking in the office. No. God, I thank you that you're here. And you can even say it in your head or while you're working, you know, Holy Spirit, I love you. Intentionally inviting Him into your space. Intentionally acknowledging that He's there. Bill Johnson always says the reality that you're most aware of is the reality that will manifest around you. So if you're not aware of God's presence, if you're just living your life, making your decision, that's what your life is going to look like. But if you know what, God, I'm going to make uh, you invite you into every space. You're going to begin to see God's things all around you because your eyes are now open to that reality of God. Does that make sense? This ain't no challenge you're sorry, but it's very applicable. And it's going to allow you to live a life 
of supernatural stuff, before we even talk about signs, wonders, and miracles, you have to learn how to live with God, to abide with God, to be a friend of God. And everything flows out of that. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing. Some of us, we've done all this stuff at the Father, we never saw the Father doing it. We thought it was a good idea, we thought it was a good friendship, we thought it was a good relationship, but everything, we can get to that place where God shows us, this is my way, and go their way in it. This is what you should do. That's how Jesus, even with his strength and his wisdom, he had a dependency on the Father. Sons depend on their Father. Sons walk in intimacy. And the last practical example, I started to share it this last week. You know, when I was talking about sons walking in intimacy, I was thinking about when uh, a father gathers his children around him. Maybe to tell them their history, or to read them a story, or they jump in the bed with him, and they listen to his story. That's what it should be like with God. I don't care how long you've been walking with God, I don't care what your title is. If you don't feel like you can get in the bed with your father and listen to him, then we're probably still struggling with an orphan spirit that next week. But we should be able to enter into this place and listen to his heart and talk to him. If you feel like, oh, I gotta stay on the outskirts, or oh, God doesn't really wanna talk to me, or maybe I don't belong with those other children, most likely you're dealing with an orphan spirit, and we'll, uh, next week we'll really hit that on the head. I will pray for you guys and break that. But God is inviting you in. He's inviting you in. You're not to be on the outside. You're not to be begging. One of our big people that we absolutely love and we're going to honor her at, um, at our women's conference, her name is Heidi Baker, and she takes care of all these orphans in Africa. And she says you can tell the difference between an orphan and a son after a while because what they do every Sunday is they invite all their children. I mean, they have like 500 orphans. They invite every Sunday, they'll invite like 100 of them into their house. And she says the sons will go into the fridge and get what they need. They'll sit down, they'll play with stuff, and you know, they'll just be there and having fun. But the orphans will shrink back. They'll probably sit by the door. They will kind of admire their other kids. They will be afraid to do anything. They have a hard time making decisions. They don't know if they belong there. But after a while, them loving on them, discipling them, they begin to transition from that. What the enemy wants from us is to be at the door. He wants us to think, okay, Jesus and God is way up there, and we, we are way down here. Whereas God is saying, I want to hold your hand. I want to walk this journey with you. I don't need you to do it perfectly. I just want you to invite me in the journey. All right? So I'm going to do a general prayer, and then I want to pray for some people. Stephen, um, oh, I was actually going to have you pray. Maybe we can put some music on back there. God, we thank you. You guys can stand up. That everything we do comes out of this place of knowing that we are loved by God, that we're in God, that we belong to the Father. And because of that, He wants to minister to us. He wants to speak to us. Lord, I ask that this morning you break every lie of the enemy that has made us feel like we don't belong. 